Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name and price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Untold Radio AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturz. Right along with me is Mr. Doug Hycheck. Tonight we got a huge show on tap for everybody, Doug. I am giddy with enthusiasm. Me Aren't too. You? Yeah. I just feel yeah. the electricity in the air. We've got Bill Munns coming on. And uh, he is a guy I've wanted to talk to for a very long time. You've never talked to him? Ho- I, I have always kind of wanted to talk to the guy. Oh, oh cool. Because I'm a big horror movie fan. <clears throat> so you know that's that's how I originally knew who Bill Munns was was through a magazine called Fangoria back in the day, where they would cover all the FX stuff about horror movies. And one of my favorite movies when I was a kid was The Return of the Living Dead, and that was one of Bill's movies that he's really mm-hmm. well known gotcha. for. And so I knew him in that, but I had no idea now. That A, he was a genius. He clearly is. Well, you have to be really smart to do what he does. Don't get me wrong. But B, nope. I had no idea he had the opinions he does on the Patty, the Patterson film, the infamous Patterson Gimlin film. We're a big foot. But really, when you think about it, who better than a special effects master could really decode that film? They know the ins, they know the outs, they know exactly what makes those things tick. As far as visuals, it's a perfect fit. So he'll be on bottom next hour. I'm excited. I'm sure you are too, Doug. Yeah. He is. You know, well, the Patterson footage is, you know, it's like the, 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 the Zabruder film. It's it's historical. People keep saying yeah. it's real. The other camp says it's fake. And hopefully Bill yeah. will clear that up tonight. Did you know that the Patterson film, a little fun fact for everybody, has been viewed more times on the internet than the JFK assassination. I can believe that. I did some digging. I probably viewed it more times. <laughs> I did some digging. I, I dug into the internet archives and I looked that specific stuff up. What is the most viewed? One of the most viewed videos on the internet. Still to this day, it is the Patterson Gimlin film. It beats out JFK. Yeah, that's, which that's I was sick. amazed by that. that. That is amazing because the JFK film is is so infamous. Have, but so have, is the Patterson game. Have you seen the new 4K version? Where <clears throat> obviously it wasn't shot in 4K; it was shot in 16 millimeter. But some of the new enhancements are pretty amazing. I like how they captured the ripples of the creature 
like the muscle movements in that 4K. You could really see the definition. Yeah. You can also see the uh, the uh, female anatomy of the creature. The breasts. Not to go. It, 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 it is a family they're, show. Yes, they're all. called breasts. Yes, they they are called breasts. Yes, mammary glands for all my friends. They're purists, but uh, anatomy purists that would scream at me for not calling them that. But that is just such an amazing thing that they have done. They've taken this footage that was originally a sixteen millimeter film, and they have been able to re render it into four K to not only preserve it but then also add that much more definition to it. So we can analyze it, people like yourself and people like Bill can analyze it that much better. So I can tell you a story. I was, God, it goes back to the 90s. I was at a studio. <clears throat> we were actually transferring a copy of the film to put it on high def. Nowhere near as good as 4K, but still good. Mm -hmm. And so we're transferring it right from the film and projecting it up on a high def screen. All the people in the studio are just joking around and goofing around and, you know, kind of putting the film down. And you should have seen the jaw drops when this high def footage went up right from the film up on the wall. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact one of those guys is, is like a big researcher now. <laughs> it just totally it just, floored him. It just changed everybody's yeah. idea of, yeah, of what it could be and... and well, you know, you're not wrong, too, because there's a lot of people that this launched their, I guess, would-be or their careers into the research of Bigfoot. This film is single-handedly really the catalyst for most of us. That was our very first exposure to Bigfoot. A lot of us was seeing this film broadcast in television or in school or in the library. Uh, stills of it are everywhere in books, so... A lot. It is like ground zero for Bigfoot. Yeah, I remember the <clears throat> first time I saw it was in 1967 when it came out. It was on the cover of Boys Life magazine. And I saw that and I went, I don't know about you, but I saw it and I went, that's a real animal. Really? What was your impression? Uh, my impression was... When I saw it, I, I was a, a child of movies, though. I mean, you got to remember, I was born in 74, so by the time I saw it, there was already a lot of movies out there with great special effects for its time. You know, now we look at it, and it's like complete cheese factory, and, you know, a lot of special effects compared to today. But my first thought is, that's got to be, no, no way, that can't be real, can it? Can that be really real? And... But what it did was it made me want to look at everything I could get my hands on about primates, about uh, giganto, gigantopithecus. Sorry, see, the pressure is still Joe. there. I know, but see, the pressure is... Now, folks, before we came on the air, and i got to let everyone know, A, there's a couple of things you've got to do. You absolutely have to do this. Number one, you have to go to untoldradio.com, all right? untoldamradio.com is where you're going to catch all these awesome shows because if you missed one you're just now tuning in you're just now catching one of these shows we have a ton of fun on the show but we also inform educate and entertain at the same time but again that is untoldradioam.com not only can you hear this show but you can also check us out learn who we are get to know us you can also get a hold of us if you want to have someone on the show as a guest we're also open to submissions as well so again that is untoldradioam.com <sighs> okay now that i got my radio announcer stuff out of the way that grabbed me so hard because it actually deep down terrified me well i'm thinking about what you just said <clears throat> it just hits me you had a totally different perspective than I did. So I'm born in 58, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, the the, um, the uh, special effects were very, very cheesy. Costumes looked like terrible costumes. Mm -hmm. But when you grew up, special effects were getting better. And so you yeah. accepted fakery better than I did. So when mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. it, it was more... 
That looks like an animal. There's no way that's yeah. a costume. Yeah. His costumes back then were horrible. They really were. See. Yeah, because when I grew up, when I saw it, E.T. had already come and gone. Yeah. Gremlins had already come and gone. Um, so we've already been seeing these creatures on film, fake creatures, a steady diet of it diet of it for many years so when i first saw this without putting in that into perspective going well wait a minute that same year that that came out planet of the apes was and that was cutting edge and now we look at planet of the apes and we laugh but that was considered the gold standard of special effects back then right and so in 67 to have this monster this creature th this bigfoot step out into the world stage was amazing looking back at it. But I thought right away, my my science geek brain that loved all things sci-fi, thought that is some really cool special effects. It can't be real. And the more I dug, though, the more I realized the limits of special effects. But now, knowing all that stuff, knowing, looking at it now, with what I, armed with what I know, that film, in my opinion, is 110% genuine. I remember looking at, it was a still photo, <clears throat> and I remember seeing the tendon under the, under the knee, under the kneecap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could see a little bit of skin, and you could see that tendon, and it looked exactly like the tendon I had in my body. Mm -hmm. And I did, it was something you would never see in a costume, ever. Now, I, I got to ask you, Doug. Did that film inspire you to create Monster Quest? No, not at all, because <clears throat> what it did is it gave me an open mind. That's it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get inspired to do Monster Quest until I actually found my own footprints up in the Arctic. And when I saw a footprint in front of a tree trunk and one in behind a tree trunk on a small tree, I went, oh boy, these things are yeah. definitely real. So it took that personal experience yep. for you to, to, to get those gears a move in to, to then take it to that next level. Yeah, because then I wanted answers because I'm like, oh, they're here. Oh, they're there. They're... I got a hold of um, Matt Moneymaker, and he said they're everywhere, you know, where there's woods, water, and hills. Mm -hmm. And I went, Minnesota? And he goes, yeah, there's tons of sightings in Minnesota. And so <laughs> you nuts, they're everywhere here. That, no. <laughs> there's I mean, there's sightings near you, Joel. Tons yeah. of them, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I and interviewed I a just, couple uh, that wasn't far from you. Yeah. Recently. Yeah, I, uh, a lot of people since doing this radio show in this local area have, have come out and talked to me privately about their own sightings. Mm -hmm. Just high strangeness. Not just Bigfoot though. It's almost like we live in a weird triangle around here. You do. Strangeness. Yeah, you do. I call it the triangle. From there all the way to Moose Lake. What's your theories on that, Doug? I mean, I don't want to get too far off topic here because we're going to be talking to the great Bill Munns tonight. But what's your theories on the strange triangle thing we got going well, on? Well, I mean, you look at the forested areas. I mean, you have some of the thickest forest near you. That goes south mm -hmm. along the, and then where the St. Croix River starts, it continues quite far south. Yeah, yeah. And most of the weird paranormal stuff happens within a certain distance from the St. Croix. So maybe the river has something to do with it. You think it's, it's the energy that thing's putting out? I mean, is, is it just something that's just know. like a magnet, maybe? <clears throat> Hmm. We're going to have to look deeper into that. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to so many people that have had weird experiences. But remember, they're not coming. They're, nobody in Minnesota is willing to just tell you. You have to drag it out of people. Yeah. But, yeah. man, when you do, it's pretty amazing. And the further north you go, it seems it's harder to drag it out of them. Yes, it is. I've also noted that, too. Uh, folks up in Ely, I love Ely, by the yeah. way. There's listeners right now in Ely, and thank you so much for tuning in. If you are, again, if you can tune in on Iron Range Radio, that's 105.5 FM in your local area, or you could tune in at ironrangeradio.com. Click the little play button. You too can join the fun. If you want to listen to Doug and I, this is Untold Radio AM. We're having a great time. But getting back to what you're saying, yeah, I've noticed that, that it is 
harder and harder to get the goods, get them to. And Ely, for me, has been my white whale. They just will not open up about what they've seen up there. You hear lots of legends up there. You hear lots of people murmuring about what they've seen, but they just won't come out and sit down with you. Yeah, I heard one really amazing story, which I can't even repeat it because they made me promise not to. But it was amazing from people up in Ely. Yeah, Ely's a wonderful, special place, though. Yeah, it's a very magical place. The end of the road. How many roads crisscross east and west? I think isn't there only two all the way to the North Pole? I I think so. Yeah, I I I don't know. I'm just like two major roads. That's it, all the way to the North Pole from Ely. Yeah. Yeah, that is it. That that is it. And they're on the edge but we, of boundary waters. We got some news though to get to, and I I don't want to cut this off because man, we could go on for hours and hours and hours just about that. And we will be going on with Bill about that same subject, man, that you just heard. The Patterson Gimlin film is so influential, and 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 Bill is so influential in his field. So it will be truly a treat to talk with him. And I got to get your reaction. It wasn't too long ago that Donald Trump was maybe taken out of context. Ah, maybe. Some believe that he threatened aliens with our military, with a super weapon so great and powerful that everyone on our Earth, planet Earth, quakes in its presence. Yeah, his timing was a little off (laughs) when he got asked about aliens because he he started bragging about the military. He said, yeah, we should, you know, I'm going to look into that, so Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But I think he was referring to the technology that captured the footage, I think. We hope. We we, we hope because, you know, okay, this is what scares me now is – I know what a lot of what Donald Trump says is firmly tongue in cheek. I mean, if the man was a comedian, oh my God, his timing's great, right? I, 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 if he gets voted out, I'm gonna miss him because he's the first entertaining president. You know, like he come up with the kung flu that was hilarious. I laughed forever. But yeah, the anyway. press, the press, Joel will have nothing to do. No, they they will have nothing Total to do. They, there will be a huge layoff happening. Yes. <laughs> if that were to happen. They will be victims uh, of, of layoffs, of, of proportions like we have never seen before. You will have reporters in bread lines just begging for a crumb I'm of a always, story. Joel, is that what that sign in your yard, vote for Trump, save the press? <laughs> well, you know, it kind of is a self-serving sign, is it not? I am a sort member of the press. Sure. And, and you, you, you know, loosely speaking. But now, I don't want him to go up against aliens that might have a billion years on us in technology and they'll just smoke us. Well, you know, not like, only, but, but not only did they say Trump appears to threaten aliens with military the likes they added, the likes of which we've never had before. I mean, you even got the byline. It's crazy. It, it is crazy. And, and they, but they took the bait. Now, this is interesting. When you read, I took the bait. I clicked the, on the, 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 but, but yeah, everybody did. Hell, I did. And, and of course I did. And I, how can you not take the bait? I mean, it's like, wow, set the hook here. But now, when Donald Trump speaks, he's not saying aliens are going to kill you. He just merged the two statements kind of together, maybe inadvertently, A, Which talking about aliens, and then merging seamlessly into the military. No, what, Joe? Okay, so here's what happened. <clears throat> he starts thinking about UFOs, and he knows the military <laughs> filmed those, you know, the uh, yep. uh, Tic Tac. And so right away, his brain just jumps to starting to brag about the military. Because he's, you know, obviously had something to do with the rebuilding it, I guess. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those, you know, little, uh, he, it's like a 
broken record. It just kind of skips to the next line. Just the needle just kind of jumps. Yeah, I don't think he meant those in the same sentence. Because I've seen was, Independence Day. Yeah, well, he wasn't saying to the aliens, "Oh man, we get the best military." <laughs> Nobody could do that. <laughs> you know, thinking you're going to threaten aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like I said, I've seen War of the Worlds. I have seen Independence Day, and I have seen Cloverfield movies. I do not want any of that to be visited upon me. But in those movies, we always win. You know, in real life, we would freaking lose immediately. We would be vaporized. Yeah, we would be. It would not. There's no way we would win a war with an alien. So no, no. Would not they, you know what? Really, really. Aliens might show up here and they'd look at our weaponry and say, man, we had those about two or 3,000 years ago. And they were great. But watch this. <laughs> <laughs> like, hold my beer, watch this, you know, watch this weapon. I mean, you know they, of course, shut off all of our nukes. Yes. All over the world. Just click, no problem. It was funny. You mentioned that Harry Reid recently was talking about that exact problem, that UFOs could unarm, make, how do you put it, make nuclear weapons unlaunchable. Yes, that's kind of an issue, Joel. They've done it. Yeah, I know. They, they have actually done it. I think that's kind of, it's pretty much undisputed. When you've gotten the testimony from all of the people that have been at these bases, UFOs hovering over the base, everything goes into no launch codes. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It's just the problem. Like just kind of, you know, just a little FYI, yep. you know, we, we, can, we, we have ways of doing things on our own too. So yeah, if know. they can do that, that means they can fly over and just shut all of our power off. That is true. They that could shut true. our radio show off. But what's stopping them from landing on the uh, South Lawn and jumping out of their little UFO and saying, okay, we're here, we're in power, get used to it? Yeah. What, I think what's we'd stopping have to it? Obey? No, I think we'd have to obey. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder what's the thing that keeps them from doing just that. Probably just being smart enough to know it. You just don't do that because there's probably God knows millions of Earths with people on them, and they're just very well could be. Very well could be. There's an abundance. You know, I was trying to drag you into the conspiracy there. You know that of of the the Eisenhower conspiracy. Not going there. No, I don't. I don't think we have a treaty. No, no, you don't believe that at all. No. Who knows, Doug? Who knows? What is that treaty? It's for interferon, for all these, they traded us technology. Yeah, yeah. If Treaties we, only matter if the other side can fight back if the yeah. treaty devolves. So like, do you like, know what's the, in that treaty, Joel? I have no idea. I, do, I have heard now on good authority from some individuals that are ex-FBI uh, agents. They have told me what the treaty is all about. Well, give me the give me the well, now the treaty now allegedly, and I do say allegedly with huge letters here. Allegedly, Eisenhower's playing golf, mind his own business, South Lawn. Well, allegedly, well, no, he actually went and met with aliens, and inside this deep down bunker, I'm assuming at Area 51. Why not? Let's call it Area 51. He's in Area 51. The aliens are there, and they say, "Hey, Ike, here's the deal." We're going to give you tons of technology to ensure that you will remain a superpower for generations to come. In exchange, whoa, whoa, whoa. we will... <clears throat> what yeah. technology, that, Joe? You can't just skip over that. Fiber optics. No, oh, that was Roswell. <laughs> it was not Roswell. No, it was. That, everybody knows <laughs> that was Ikey that got oh, that for okay. us. Okay, was it Roswell? Though? And seriously, I think it was. <laughs> Okay, all right. Because again, this, I There's don't believe this. There's conflicting stories. You could be right. I, I, I hate. I don't believe this. I, I never said I believed it. I, I just said this is what I have been told. told. So keep going. I want to hear this. Okay. Technology. Okay. Now the technology it was a fiber optics uh, computers, micro microchips. Um, yep, microchips, microprocessors, things like that. And headphones. then right after headphones, huh? headphones. I think headphones were already existing by then. <laughs> that was from the other aliens that stopped oh. by. They had the headphones. 
I couldn't and, and, Sorry. You know, you know they, they had headphones and, you know, that kind of, and, and ovens. They had those, too. And fire and wheels. But any... <laughs> <laughs> that... Oh, my good Lord, Doug. Um, that is, in the nutshell, what allegedly happened to Eisenhower. Was the aliens showed up, gave him the technology, said, in, in return now, Ikey, we get to take... A certain amount of the populace. Whatever you're funny, Peacock's got it exclusively. Bears beats The Office on Peacock. Stream every moment from Dunder Mifflin and explore bonus extras and exclusives. Plus, if you're looking for more classic hits, you can stream every episode of Parks and Recreation, Two and a Half Men, and every season of SNL. In the mood for something brand new? Check out Peacock's original comedies, The Amber Ruffin Show, and Saved by the Bell. Whether you're craving a new binge or familiar fave, you can find tons of comedy hits on Peacock. Get started for free at PeacockTV.com. Whatever you're funny, Peacock's got it exclusively. Stream classic sitcoms like The Office, Parks and Recreation, and Two and a Half Men. Plus, catch Peacock original comedies like AP Bio and Saved by the Bell. For all your exclusive comedy faves, go to PeacockTV.com and get started. We get to abduct who we want, when we want. And you're not going to interfere in this. Because if you do interfere with this, we're going to have a problem there, Ike. As long as you enjoy your little technology and you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. So they gave us headphones and ovens. No, not headphones. They already existed headphones. <laughs> I know they did, Joel. It just... <laughs> That's what I get to look at while we're doing this show. Is Joe <laughs> my my my, be- He's my got beautiful white headphones. white headphones, and you know they're they're not for everybody. The white <laughs> who in the world wears white headphones? I Nobody. Do. I, do. I do. I do because I love they got, them. They gotta go, Joe. <laughs> do they really? No, the white headphones. That they, they they are. They're a wonderful, wonderful thing, white headphones. They separate me from every other broadcaster out there. That's true. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if it's a good separation, but a separation nonetheless. Okay, All now you what's your do, take? Joe, just go in the garage, yeah. take some black spray paint, <laughs> <laughs> put a lot of Krylon and... Get all of your headphones. We're oh, good. Can you do you that? Know, break? Can you do that? You know, you, you know, my dozens and dozens of fans. <laughs> no, sorry, I said dozens. dozens. Dozens and dozens of fans may not agree with you. They, they may I like. I think it would be fun because then the paint wouldn't be dry <laughs> during the break. Then you'd have black spots all over your head and face. I would probably have a black band going up around my head <laughs> it, it, it would not be pretty doug be it would stripe. not be pretty listen, listen to you stripe headphones listen stripe. to you <laughs> now can we can we talk about one more story doug I, and i'm really i mean yes. seriously let, let, let's not dwell on my headphones and just to let you know yeah there was already headphones by the way people don't even, don't even listen to what doug's telling you there is already headphones you know what i'm saying okay anyhow but not white ones <laughs> They probably were. Let's okay, change the subject now. <laughs> you are killing me here. You, you are you're, you are absolutely killing me here. Okay, so now we're going to move to California for the this next story. There was an individual that was in the redwood forest, and he was with his son, and they were enjoying a, a nice walk, uh, and they came across. What is only to be looked like? Uh, and hello, Bill. By the way, and we will be running a break here okay. momentarily, folks. Uh, they they captured what they believe Doug to be, and Bill, now that you're here, a Bigfoot yeah. in a tree stand of all things in the redwood forest. Now, upon further review of said Bigfoot, what's your take on this, Doug? Before we run to break. Well, I looked at the photo. In fact, I imported it into Adobe, so it made it past that important stage. And I'm seeing all these squares, angles. Bigfoots don't have squares and angles on them, so I think it's a bunch of parts, because actually it was not a deer stand. It looks like a deer stand, but it's part of the skyway. They're building a skyway from tree to tree so people can walk, a walkway. And 
it's if that was a Bigfoot first off, it would probably be 30, 40 feet wide. <laughs> yeah. See, I thought it was more of an Ewok then at that rate. Well, if yeah. you look at the photo, it kind of from a distance, it looks like it's got muscles, yeah. breasts. You know, it, we were talking yeah. about Bigfoot breasts earlier, but it's it's not it's not a Bigfoot. I just no. I can't believe this stuff makes the news. I cannot either. We're gonna run a break. We come back. We have the great Bill Munns with us. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips, and whoa, did not need to see that. I'm Tom Bodette for Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up? Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals, make some smart investments, open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrified right now listen if winning the lottery were easy everyone would do it when it comes to financial stability don't get left behind get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org this message brought to you by the american institute of cpas and the ad council northern tool and equipment so me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot well it happens that's cheering for the wrong team oh this is war even worse they've got this couch set up and everything a couch yeah it's a sectional all right first thing don't ever use the word sectional again done second i want you to grab a 4700 pound tow chain with j-hook and grab hammer throw that on the back of your truck got it now you're gonna hail mary the j-hook over the end of that couch time to find a better spot for your new friends There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the Wacky Waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the Wacky Waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to Geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. And welcome back to Untold Radio AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Doug Hycheck. We got a great guest on tap tonight. Uh, we have Bill Munns on with us tonight. And he is, really got to be honest, he is uh, he's the guy that made one of my very favorite monster movies as a kid. And I didn't want to bring it up during the interview, but The Return of the Living Dead was one of my favorite movies as a kid, Bill. Thank you for making that movie. It was a great uh, film. Love it. Yeah, okay. It, it was a weird experience for me. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet it was. I bet it was. 
Yeah. Uh, getting getting to more serious stuff, Bill's a genius special effects engineer who has built many movie creatures and costumes, as well as hominid replicas and super realistic primate models for museums and movies. He is also a robotics ex- expert, a film and camera expert with ambient hands-on abundant rather hands-on experience with 16 millimeter film and technology of the 1960s a decade ago he began his long journey to debunk or or validate the 1967 patterson gimlin film in the process he assembled the most comprehensive film image archive in the world and i'll leave it right there bill man that that is quite the opener right there uh wow yeah i'm I, I mean, i'm tired just listening to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know what got you i know i'm kind of going off game plan here but what got you into that film i, I mean was it something you'd been watching for many, many years, or was something that kind of came at you out of nowhere, and you kind of took it upon yourself to figure this thing out? Well, um, I've known about it practically since it came out. I mean, probably by um, early of 1968, uh, when it was starting to get publicity, like in Argosy Magazine, they did a write-up, I think, in February of 68, with pictures of it and everything. Um, So I've been aware of it since that time. And oddly enough, at that time, I was starting to get into uh, makeup and makeup effects work, and uh, I was very attentive to the Planet of the Apes movie, which had just come out that same month, and 2001 A Space Odyssey with the Dawn of Man Apes, which are absolutely incredible. Uh, It came out a few months later. So at the same time I was initially getting familiar with the Patterson film, I was giving a tremendous amount of attention to the creation of ape-like characters for human actors to perform. So my interest in the two kind of developed in parallel. And one thing that always stuck out in my mind from the very beginning was that I'd look at the Patterson film, and based on what I knew about Planet of the Apes and the 2001 Apes, uh, I keep looking at the Patterson film and keep saying to myself, we don't build ape suits like this. This just doesn't Mm -hmm. fall into the usual form and the usual technique. So that idea kind of was haunting me in the back of my mind as the years went on. Um, I didn't get serious about studying the Patterson film at any length. Um, It was just a curiosity, more or less. But every time I did think about it, I always kept coming back to the idea. I wait a minute, we don't build ape suits like this. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual transition where I jumped into the deep end uh, was around 2008. I was reading an article in the L.A. Times about uh, a man who was a Bigfoot researcher and had a lot of footprint casts. And, uh, they were doing an article about him and... He was talking about the controversy of the Patterson film, and there were some things about what was brought up during this interview that made me suggest that the people who were researchers on the film didn't know anything about the reality of special makeup effects and filmmaking. So I did a little research, hooked up in the Bigfoot forum, and I was actually astonished at how much image material was there available to study, far more than I had ever realized because I'd never looked into it before. And as soon as I saw how much material there was to work with, I really started looking at it in a much more meticulous way. And then, uh, you know, I just fell down the rabbit hole and I've been in Wonderland ever since. What is it, Bill, about the Patterson footage, though, that's worth all of this study. I mean, has there? there's probably never even been a film that's been studied this many times by so many people. But what well, makes it worthy? I mean, can you describe the film and why it's so special? Um, yeah, definitely. Why it is so special is very simply... There is more evidence, more data, more material to work with for analysis in this one film 
than practically everything else in the whole Bigfoot phenomenon combined. You can take every other known picture, image, video, movie, whatever, put them all together, and all of them will not have as much data to work for to actually come to a conclusion as what you'll find in the Patterson film. It is unquestionably the gold standard in terms of evidence Mm -hmm. of this phenomenon. So part of what is so unique about it is the sheer volume of good evidence you have to work with to do analysis. But the second thing that, for me personally, makes it so powerful is that once you get to the realization that this film is something authentic, it is not a human in a costume, it was not hoaxed, faked, staged, or planned in any way. Okay, once you get to that conclusion, what you then have to go to, taking the next step, is that this film turns the entire scientific study of physical anthropology on its head. And that power to completely revolutionize physical anthropology to me, is what makes it so utterly unique and important. Isn't it rare, Bill, to have a Bigfoot film? I mean, it's shot in film, not video. Yeah, right. Which I want you, really want you to expound on that. Because um, I keep hearing from people, oh, that's the 1967 video of the, <laughs> of the Bigfoot. Yeah. And I always have to correct people, no, that's film. But, yeah. but the main thing is, is this thing's out in the open. For the most part, it's unblocked. You know, you can see everything. It's not behind trees and leaves. Correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I I think in the the way that uh, the two men who were there, uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, the way they describe the encounter and how it began pretty well explains that. They were just on horseback riding up a trail along the edge of Bluff Creek, and there was a huge ball, root ball of debris that had been washed down from some earlier flooding. And basically they could not see beyond that root ball until they actually got right up to it and sort of went around it. And that was when they saw this subject figure that we commonly call Patty by the stream as if she was looking to try to harvest something in the water. And their horses got spooked. Uh, Roger tried to grab his camera from his saddlebag. The creature, Patty, she got up and started to walk away. So that encounter was catching her by surprise. Almost anything out in the woods, I doubt if there's any way in the world you're going to catch one of these by surprise. But under those circumstances, between the root ball that was hiding her and the sound of the stream, which was hiding the sound of the horseback, It was the perfect situation for someone to come upon one of these creatures in close range, in the open, and sneak up on it, so to speak. And Almost any other encounter I've ever seen, that that wouldn't have happened. Plus, I mean, they were on horseback, which the Bigfoot might have thought it was an elk, elk, a group of elk approaching. You know, I've thought about that stuff, and I'm like, God, it's just, yeah, the root, the stream sound. The, um, the type of soil they were on, you know, and the scent even of the horses may not have, you know, um, heard anything either. That wasn't, it, you know, they weren't just a bunch of men crunching around in the forest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. But and most if, important. If they were, they would have plenty of time to see it when the men were still far away, but not in this particular circumstance. So that's but, probably what's completely unique about it, too. The other neat thing about the Patterson footage is when you think about it, and I've got maybe a hundred film cameras, spring wind, they go on instantly, Bill. Correct? I mean there's no um, You mean how long there's no they powering run? up? Uh, yeah, they do start instantly, yes. Um, the r- camera that Roger was using, it's a Kodak K one hundred camera. Uh, has the largest spring of any spring-driven camera in existence. Most of your spring-drive cameras that you wind up, they'll run for 20 to 30 seconds on a wind. The Mm -hmm. Kodak camera will run a minute and 40 seconds on a wind. Uh, The spring is incredibly powerful, and it gets up to full speed by the second frame 
of the film. That's, so it, it comes up that fast. Yeah. Well, that how it? Yeah, but that's nuts. What, sorry, Joel, but how is it oh, that in 1967 they had better technology as far as speed and to get a camera up to speed than we do now with our cell phones and our, you know, I mean, it takes quite a while. Pull my cell phone on, I got to scroll and, you know, hit things. Well, you're talking about a digital device, remember? Right. You're not talking about a purely mechanical device. You're talking about a digital device. Um, Anybody's ever turned on their computer at home and sat there for a minute or two waiting for the damn thing to get started knows electronic things sometimes take a while to get going because the manufacturers have put a million little idiotic subroutine tasks to get it started up uh and mm-hmm. a lot of them hold waiting for they, they they start something and then they're waiting for a response from another thing and they may wait too long for it um they've just made devices incredibly complicated but a good old-fashioned film camera that actually was shooting physical film uh it's remarkably simple in its mechanism and it does just one job which means you turn it on run film period mm-hmm. um your devices will do are trying to do like a hundred things when you start them up uh, most of them you're not aware of but under the hood they're they're happening yeah and they'll slow the damn thing down tremendously Even and so you're right yeah because it's still didn't even have to so. focus did he roger did not have to focus he didn't because shooting Kodachrome 2 film, which was the film type, outdoors in bright sunlight, and it was very bright sunlight, um, you're shooting at about uh, F8 on the F-stop range with a common lens on there, the standard lens that the camera comes with. Uh, at F8, it has what's called a hyperfocal distance. In other words, the near and far that are in acceptable focus. Um, And at that f-stop and that lens, the hyperfocal distance is from about 10 feet to infinity. So he didn't have to touch the focus, and he probably had the f-stop already set up for outdoors daylight. So all he had to do was click the trigger, turn it on, and go for it. What I find to be very important for me anyway is not only the camera is almost full, you know, foolproof, but the film is a physical evidence of this creature in front of that camera. Yeah. It, it, it's set in stone. There's no messing around with it. Like today, I can manipulate a, a digital photograph all day. And, mm-hmm. you know, but that film is the film. There's a negative involved. That film exists. So that creature was indeed in front of that camera. Yeah, just a minor technical correction. Um, there was no negative. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I suppose. I was thinking 35-millimeter film. <laughs> Never mind. But no, yes. no, there's two types of film. One is a negative-positive film, like Kodakolor, and one is what's mm-hmm. called a reversal positive, which means the actual film you run in the camera, once it's processed, that actual film comes back to you as a positive image. That's what Kodachrome was. And that's what Roger was shooting, was a reversal positive film. So even the first one that was taken out of the camera is a positive image. And each subsequent copy is also a reversal positive. Um, very, very few people on the, the low-budget amateur or level would shoot uh, a color negative film. That was usually reserved for big-budget studios. So an amateur like Roger would shoot a reversal film like Kodachrome. But you are right in that the preservation of the image on that physical film almost guarantees there's practically nothing you can do to tamper with it in any way as compared to digital imagery, whether it's video or still pictures or whatever of today, which can be manipulated to an awesome extent. But good old-fashioned film, it was almost nothing you could do to it to manipulate it in any way. Uh, Mm -hmm. that could reasonably be done to change what we see in the film and fake something where the reality was different or less impressive or whatever. Uh, So in that sense, it's better that it was on film than just digital video or digital imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, really quickly, and not that I guess it really doesn't matter a whole lot, but was he? He was not on horse. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name and price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Introducing Peacock, the new free streaming service from NBC Universal. It's hit movies, current shows, live sports, trending bits, and timeless hits. And that's why you can't not watch. Peacock, watch for free, upgrade for more. Stream now at PeacockTV.com. Law and order SVU streaming now. He's back while well, he filmed that, was he? He was... Off you know, he, the horse his horse was spooked. rearing up. His horse was rearing up, got spooked. He jumped off the horse. He was a former rodeo rider, so he's fairly familiar with how to dismount from a horse, even if the horse was a bit unruly. Uh, as soon as he got on the ground, he grabbed the camera out of his saddlebag, and then on the ground he went chasing the creature, running while he was filming. Did... <clears throat> did... When... Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, didn't Roger practice that movement? I mean, that's what I think Bob told me one time. I don't know if it's true because you've spent far more time with Bob than probably anybody. But yeah. I had heard that he had practiced grabbing the camera uh, out of the saddlebag and hopping off the horse. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't recall Bob saying that specifically, but I have read that from several people who okay. uh, knew Roger personally and described things that he did when he was interested in the Bigfoot phenomenon, which started in the around 1960 or so, and when, then went all the way until his death in 72. Um, but when he was going out on these little expeditions, um, some of his preparations, yeah, there was talk that he had prepared to actually dismount from a spooked horse, grab the camera, and such like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Did... Did Bob um, impress you when you first met him? I mean, what was your thoughts on Mr. Bob Gimlin? Um, Well, it's kind of funny, actually. When I first met him, I went up to Yakima. There was an event there. I sort of met Bob, shook hands and such like that. But the first time that I actually got him alone and just sat down with him so we could talk was in a Black Angus steakhouse there. Um, And... We were there for about an hour, hour and a half, had dinner together, and oddly enough, the entire time, we never talked about the film. We just talked about, you know, anything and everything. And what I found from that conversation was that it struck me that he was just a a remarkably honest, straightforward, down-to-earth guy, you know. If he was If he was trying to con anybody, you know, about the film or, what happened or anything like that, he would have been schmoozing me all through the dinner. But uh, he st- just struck me as just being absolutely honest, sincere, straightforward. And uh, I have all the much more respect for him, given what he encountered, because I have confidence in his sincerity. And as far as I know, Bob never received a penny for the film. Is that true, Bill? Um. Not that I know of. Yeah, Roger basically cut him out of all of the revenues they were generating when they did the theatrical showings. Um, Bob never received any of that. The only thing he ended up doing when Roger passed away was he went to court and basically filed suit asking the judge to find him as part owner of the film. Mm. Uh, And the judge, oddly enough, split it so that Bob was given 51% ownership and control of a publishing revenue that might be derived if still pictures from the film are published. And Patricia got 49% and the rights to license the showing of the film itself for any TV, film, documentary, or whatever like that. So Patricia's made quite a bit of money over the many years licensing this to documentaries. Uh, what Bob did, on the other hand, is he took his rights, his legal gr- uh, verdict, his grant of rights, and he sold it to another researcher, Renee DeHendon, 
uh, either for one dollar or ten dollars. I've heard both of them as far as mm-hmm. the amount of it. Basically, he wasn't making any attempt whatsoever to profit by the film. So if you follow the money with Bob, he, there's no motivation, none. Yeah, absolutely zero. Yeah, it's amazing. I was going to say, wouldn't that create some bitterness? But it doesn't sound like Bob was, is really after any kind of real money. Uh, or, uh, no, he wasn't. As near as I can know, tell. You know, you know. oddly enough, um, really quickly, I don't mean to cut you off, but when we did have okay. him at a Bigfoot event uh, recently, Doug was there, I was there, and we had him remotely. He had mentioned to the crowd that this film has actually made his life kind of hard. Yeah, it did. It was a disaster for the poor guy. First, because he never really expected it to happen. You know, he just went along with Roger on the trip because Roger needed a hand. They were going to go into the woods and horseback. He needed a second person who could help him with the horses and uh, maybe do a little tracking of stuff. And so he just needed somebody to come along with him, and Bob agreed because he was a friend. He never expected any of this to happen. After it happened, it became like a curse because obviously a lot of people, they look at the film, they think it's fake. They -hmm. think that Roger faked it, and thus Bob had to be in on it. And they ridiculed him that he insisted that it's true it was you know wasn't a fake film and this ridicule haunted him for the longest time and actually did in a, almost ruin his life completely luckily he's kind of pulled out of it and he's you know a happy wonderful kind man again but yeah it it was a curse literally on his life mm-hmm. I, I can see that I can see that. Yep. Go ahead. I don't even. I don't even think Bob knew how many people really looked at him as kind of a hero. Yeah. Um, I had the pleasure of going with him or being attending an event way back in like 2000, which I believe was his first Bigfoot convention, and he was just surprised at all the people that wanted to talk to him and get his autograph and. You know, because he always looked down on himself about the film. Yeah. And here he was. Well, I think the, a new I think the high visibility people, the people who were more likely to express an opinion, were the critics. So I suspect mm-hmm. he got more criticism than he ever got reassurance or, you know, compliments or praise. So, you know, for the longest time, this endless criticism, disrespect, jokes, uh, insults and everything has just been piling up. And when he finally got into the community of researchers and, you know, aficionados of it and such like that, and finally saw how many people did respect and admire him, uh, I'm sure it was quite a revelation for him. And thank God, you know, it's a revelation on the good side. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, the fame sometimes is not what you really want and, and it sounds like oh it can be from, cruel from <laughs> what i understand he, he he enjoys being a you know he's a very low-key individual even when we had him at the event uh very genuine individual as well oh yeah from what i've obs- what i've observed and uh very uh very just these are the facts and this is the way it is and i think you're right though that that it took that validation though from the community showing that he's accepted by them and, and maybe not listening to the critics so much that helped him a lot. Um, I couldn't imagine living in the shadow of that. I couldn't imagine yeah. living in that shadow and always you're not, not just known as Bob Gimlin. You're known as Bob Gimlin, the guy that helped film the Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're never truly your own man. You're always attached to something. Yeah. Well, then there was a huge amount of people that came forward, and I think Bill can probably explain this more than anybody, but numbers of people came and took credit for the Patterson footage. Um, maybe you can kind of expound on that, Bill, but that must have just tortured Bob. It was always somebody new. Yeah, um, that's a phenomenon that uh, occurs all over the place. It's It's absolutely rank throughout Hollywood and drives people absolutely bonkers. 
Uh, best example of that's John Chambers, who was the lead makeup artist and designer on the Planet of the Apes. Okay, John had a crew of about a hundred and seventy-five makeup artists on that show, but still. All of the preparation, all the design, making all the rubber pieces that were put on the face. He did practically all of that himself with only one lab assistant, Tom Berman, who ended up being a very fine makeup artist in his own right. But Tom was his apprentice at that time. And the two of them basically did pretty much everything in terms of design, prep, all the creative work that leads up to it. And this 175 makeup artist army of his, they were just putting it on and painting it and stuff like that on the actors. But after the film became this runaway hit in Hollywood, an amazing number of people, makeup artists, would tell someone, yeah, I did Planet of the Apes. But when you say that, that implies you're the designer, you're the creator, not I'm one of the 175 crew people on Planet of the Apes. They make it sound like they're the boss, they're the, the mm -hmm. boss. And it hurt John Chambers so badly that so many people in the profession would be delighted to mislead people and pretend they were the designer. Mm -hmm. His credit away from him. But yeah, it was happening all wants the time. To people be, just do yeah, that. Want, yeah, everyone wants their fame. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and that's horrible. And yeah, and any any incredibly popular phenomenon. People are going to come out of the woodwork taking credit. It's just a curious flaw of human nature that people do that. No, I, 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 I got to bring this up, and I, I don't know how to bring this up. I would say probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I, I, I'm a host of another radio show, uh, and, and an individual got a hold of my office named Philip Morris, and I talked with him, and he claimed that he, at that time, made this costume. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name or not. And and I want to get your take on if you indeed have heard of him and heard that Who controversy. Philip oh, Morris? Morris? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's a, a Halloween and novelty costume maker somewhere, I think, back east in the deep south, South Carolina, something like that, I think. Um, yeah, he came out of the woodwork saying, yeah, Roger bought one of his costumes, and that's what you see in the film, but Roger's modified it a bit. Um, he's just blatantly promoting his business. There's mm -hmm. an ounce of truth to it. Nothing he has ever made resembles what we see in the Patterson film in any clear way. Um, but there's, there's, there's a, a little... Uh, kind of a twist to this whole discussion that uh, most people don't realize, and that is that it is possible Roger did buy a costume from him, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is possible Roger put somebody into the costume and filmed the person running around in the woods. That's not what we see in his famous Patterson film. But Roger could have done that because he was trying to do a documentary on the Bigfoot subject. And almost any responsible producer of a documentary on Bigfoot is going to consider and probably try to do getting a person in a costume and filming it in the woods as a recreation mm -hmm. of a described encounter because in documentary filmmaking, you have to think in terms of the visual. You don't just want a person staring at the camera telling the story. That's very weak in terms of mm -hmm. visuals go. You want something stronger. So in a Bigfoot documentary, you're almost guaranteed you're going to try to put a guy in a costume and let him run around in the woods and then put that over somebody's commentary of, yeah, I saw him over in the parking lot across the street at 5 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And mm -hmm. you want something like that. So it's perfectly plausible. Roger could have actually bought a costume from Philip Morris. It's possible he could have put somebody in it, possibly even um, Bob Aronimus, a friend of his, who claims he wore a costume for Roger. It's possible he actually did that. But whatever he did with that, it's not the film that we see. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. The one we see actually has something biologically real, exactly as it appears, and it's not a human in a costume. But 
Roger could have done that, and it would have been perfectly logical if he did. Mm-hmm. There's nothing sneaky about it. There's nothing that undermines his credibility as a yeah. filmmaker or a researcher or explorer. That's standard yeah. operating procedure for people doing documentaries back then. So, so, so the Philip kinda... Morris thing, even though he, what we see in the Patterson film is definitely not a Philip Morris costume, it is possible that Morris and Patterson actually did do business together. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. kind of makes well, it a little messy for people who like yeah. like neat solutions with simple yeses and nos. That kind of you know is the gray in between, but. Uh, it kind of makes it a little more complicated, but Philip Morris did not do anything which is in the Patterson film. Absolutely well, unequivocal. Filmmakers, like you'd said, do that even today. I mean, you watch oh, yeah. anything on any of the documentary channels, like, I'm just going to throw another, like, Travel Channel, and they're talking about yeah. Bigfoot. Oh, my God, it'd be so boring just to see a man droning on about what he saw. No, you have to have that, that visual representation as close as you can get exactly. to what actually happened. Makes yes. complete sense. Bill, what what are the limits of a costume? I mean, you gotta get in the thing. So you gotta have yeah. you have to have a zipper. You've got to be able to yeah. put the head on. So can you as an expert kind of explain that to everybody? Yeah, sure. Um, regardless of what it's supposed to look like on the outside, which is the artistic or aesthetic demands of the costume. It is a mechanical device, and it must function in a reasonable mechanical way. Now, putting a guy in a fursuit, the first thing you've got to deal with is the fact that the person inside is going to heat up real fast, and if their butt not cooled off, they're going to faint. They're going to sweat so much, it'll disrupt the electrolyte function of the body. The person will pass out. You'll have to get them to an emergency hospital if you want to keep them alive. That actually happened to a guy named Don McLeod filming a movie called Tanya's Island. He was in a full costume. He was in a place where the crew couldn't easily get to him. Um, They put him in there. They let him sit around. They were setting the camera, checking the focus, Mm F-stop, check the lights, and the other. And he's in the costume the whole time, and he's sweating and sweating and sweating. And finally, when he starts getting ready to acting, he's been in the costume so long he has sweated so much, he lost so much water, his body was dehydrated, the electrolyte function of his body shut down, and he fainted, and he nearly died. They had to emergency evacuate him to a local hospital. That can happen. So what we have learned building costumes and putting people in it is it's a hassle getting them out of the entire costume. But if you can break them out of the head, if you can get the head off, and let the person sit down in front of a fan, blowing air right across their face, their body can manage the rest of the heat fairly well. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get the head off, you're going to lose them. (laughs) That's simple. So first mechanical thing that we always do, we have to design a costume so that we can get the head off easily. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. That makes total sense. Now, Easiest way to do that is not connect the head to the body and hope that the hair is long enough going down on the neck to kind of hang on the body and hide the separation. Well, Mm -hmm. that works with real long hair. You could do it with someone like Chewbacca. Yeah, sure. But you can't do it with Patterson's creature because the hair is too short. So the only way you can get the head and the body smooth, one flowing right into another, is if you have a closure, like a Velcro or hook an eye or something like that. You don't have a zipper around the neck. I've never heard anybody do that. I mean, I suppose it's physically possible, but I've never heard of it done. Um, Usually it's like Velcro or hooks and eyes or something like that. But when you have this connection that joins the headpiece to the, the body piece at the neck, that connection is relatively rigid. Okay, that's a big problem. For the fur cloth that was available in 1967, which was basically like shag carpet, really, it had a very, very stiff backing to it. It was not flexible in any way, shape, or form. Um, When you're dealing with that kind of a fur cloth and it's relatively short, you have to, to merge two pieces together, you have to press them 
really tight against each other and to hold them in place, the understructure that joins the two makes that rim around the neck completely rigid. Now, what that's going to do is going to make it hard for you to have the person inside even turn their head to the side because this is just too rigid. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way they used to cheat it when they did the old Tarzan movies like Johnny Weissmuller and all that with chimpanzee characters and gorilla characters was that they'd build the shoulders up so that the shoulders were much higher than the neck. And then this kind of... uh, junction between the head and the, 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 the neck, um, you could have more fur there, which would kind of fold over itself, but it was loose to allow the person to move their head, and these big lumpy shoulders would hide all of that wrinkled fur that's actually connecting the head to the torso. Well, Patty doesn't have that. She turns her head to the side, literally looking right over her shoulder. When she turns her head back, her neck, going from the head through the neck down into the back that we're seeing from behind, is absolutely flawless. Now, you're not going to get that happen with any kind of a juncture between the head mask and the neck on a costume that you make back in those days. Okay, yeah. nobody solved the problem until about 1984, 1985, when Rick Baker did some work on a film called Grey Stoke, The Legend of Tarzan. And they finally had fur that was tied into a spandex stretch base. And they actually pulled the fur, the stretch spandex fur, from the torso all the way up the neck to the top of the head. So instead of taking off a full mask that covered off the entire head, they'd actually have a mask that went on the front of the face. And the, the fur cloth on the back of the head went all the way down through the neck to the torso. So that was uninterrupted, and it was soft and flexible. So the head could move around and all of that, and you wouldn't have anything that was any kind of a a fur brushing up backwards or twisting or gaps in it or anything like that that you might have. But that was 1984, not 1967. In 67, there was nothing you could do to get that smooth juncture between the head and the neck and allow the head as much flexibility as we see in the film, and after the head turned, to be able to look at the back of the neck and see it as flawlessly smooth. So that's actually one of the mechanical considerations of a fur costume back in 67 that is powerfully conclusive that what we're seeing is a real creature. It's not a costume with a human in it. If (coughs) they would have used... You could put one down the back and have a one-piece jumpsuit. That's common. I've Bill, if they would have those. used that 1984 technology on Patty, would you be able to tell? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, if they would have used that 1984 technology with the stretch fabric, would you have been able to tell? Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name and price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus. The Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool. Only from Progressive. The owl and a foul of the comatose Coxwain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. This week at Target, clean up with a free $10 gift card when you buy three select laundry or cleaning essentials from Tide, Glad, Downy, and more. Take spring cleaning to the next level at Target, where lower prices and great deals make it easy. To save, restrictions may apply. That that system was uh, used on Patty. Uh, all you, well, it would have solved the problem of the neck. Yes. It would look natural. But would it, it would look natural have... from the rear, from the back side? Yes, it would. It would. Yes, it would. Okay. Yeah. But it would still not solve the problem of the shape of the head. Mm-hmm. See, the mm-hmm. shape the shape of the head defies what all normal mask technology requires. We want uh, to create the illusion of a face with a powerful brow ridge, and we want a head that slopes almost straight back after the brow ridge instead of going up the way a human skull does. Now, the human, if it's a costume, the human wearing the mask, his skull's going to go straight up. 
Okay. You can make the brow ridge much, much heavier than it normally is, and you can get a little better angle going back. It's not going straight back, but it's a little better. It's not quite straight up. But if you're going to pull a brow ridge out that far, then you've got to pull the muzzle of the face, the mouth area, mm-hmm. and the nose even further out than you do the brow ridge. And then to kind of balance everything out, you've got to kind of build it up in the back. And you end up making a head much bigger than a human head when you do this. And there's just no getting around it. Yeah. We cannot subtract from the human actor's face. Be nice if we could, you know, just take a, a slicer knife or machete or something and whack off the top of his skull, you know, bandage it and put a <laughs> makeup over it. But, of course, that's not going to work for the actor. Um, no. There's no way we can subtract from the human face. We can only add. So when we mm-hmm. want to create an illusion that we're subtracting something, we have to build up all the other areas. So by proportion or by comparison, something seems diminished. But you end up with a huge head. Now, Patty's head is remarkably small, yet right after the brow ridge, the head goes straight back, not up, not even on an angle. It's just straight mm-hmm. back. It's almost a right angle from the line of her face to the line going on the back of the cranium. It's basically impossible to create that effect on a human with a mask and keep it that small. So, okay, yeah, yeah. As, Doug, as you said, yeah, the, the, the stretch for cloth that came out in 1984 and there, thereafter, that would have solved the back of the neck problem, yes. But well, what, about the, what about the, the eye sockets, Bill? So what you're describing, I'm picturing the, the top of the head, of the human head, mm-hmm. sticking yeah. out of the costume. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, there's just no way and, with and that technology. Trust me, we makeup artists have been making apes since probably the 1930s. So we're talking about 90 years that makeup artists in Hollywood have been trying to make a perfect ape head with a human inside. In mm-hmm. 90 years of an incredible number of geniuses trying it, nobody succeeded. Can't be done. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, when I'm when I'm I'm actually watching the film as you're talking on YouTube here, and and something just hit me just out of the blue. If I was going to fake this, and and if I wanted to pull this over, why would I make her female? That would add yeah. so much more complexity to what I'd have to add to that costume to make it believable with the mammary yeah. gl- with the mammary glands. What? Makes no sense to me. Yeah, exactly. Well, A, it makes no sense. And then B, um, real organic breasts are actually kind of uh, fluid. Uh, They have a whole motion dynamic of their own, what is commonly referred to as jiggle in the Mm -hmm. TV industry from the 70s and 80s. Um, Anyways, breast masses that are natural have some element of fluidity. The prosthetics of the time, going back to the 60s, had no fluidity whatsoever. Again, modern technology has advanced so that now in costumes can be made with special types of resins uh, that actually emulate the fluidity and the flabbiness of natural live tissue remarkably well. Um, Mm -hmm. All you have to do is look at a movie called Norbert, Eddie Murphy, and he plays not only himself, a male character, but he plays a female character in a bodysuit where she's like 250 pounds, and at one point they go to a water park and she's wearing a bikini, and there's this flab all over the place, and it just jiggles so wonderfully. It is so amazingly realistic, it's unbelievable. But this is in the 90s or the 2000s. This is not 1967. In 67, mm-hmm. we didn't have anything that you could make prosthetics out of or parts of a body costume that would jiggle. You just didn't. So to build a breast that doesn't move would be self-defeating because it'll look phony. Mm-hmm. To build a breast 
artificially that does move required a technology that nobody had at the time. So there again, what you're saying, um, if Roger was trying to fake this with and get himself a costume, he would not have attempted anything like that. You're right. He would have used a gender-neutral figure that you might mistake for a male. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. would be done. Yeah. Well, that would be the mo- that'd be the sure bet. You, you, you know, less moving parts, less problems. Yeah. You, you yeah. Know, so. Well, if Roger would have had that kind of technology, couldn't he have made just millions of dollars? Using his costume technology. Yeah. He could have gone to Hollywood and he could have blown away John Chambers and Stuart mm-hmm. Freeborn combined. Yeah, he could have made way more money. Oh, yeah. But he was not educated in the film industry, am I correct? I mean, he was more of the amateur filmmakers, so he had yeah. nothing at the he Hollywood had, he, studios. Yeah, he had no filmmaking background in terms of on a, on a Hollywood level. No, he had nothing. Has it has it ever been calculated what Roger ended up making from 1967 till 1972 when he died? I don't know. I've seen some documents that suggest that they were running balance sheets for what they were bringing in when they were four-walling the theater around the country and uh, collecting the revenues from it. But I don't know that it's ever been actually added up, so I couldn't answer that. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I just really couldn't imagine it was that much money. Yeah. You can get coffee mugs and T-shirts and you name it now with Patty on it. I mean, you, you know, so well, I yeah, imagine. Well, yeah, merchandising today. Um, yeah. They weren't keen on merchandising back then. Actually, most people never gave it a thought. It wasn't until uh, George Lucas came out with Star Wars in 77, 10 years later, and he merchandised the hell out of it that filmmakers fell in love with merchandising. Yeah, him and Kiss standard. are the two, the two yeah. most merchandised but it, things but in the world. Seven, no, nobody was thinking merchandising either. Say, Bill, I, I heard that you had gotten a grant to actually study the Patterson footage. Uh, actually, several. Uh, in conjunction oh, yeah. with wow. Jeff Meldrum at Idaho State University, yeah. What did you guys do? Can you kind of go into some of the details? Uh, the, the major grant that I got allowed us to do a lot of research on the whole issue of uh, the breast motion. Uh, it allowed me to actually make costumes and fabricate breast forms on the costumes uh, that were made out of all of the materials that were available in 1967, which would have been slip rubber flexible polyfoam with a slip rubber skin, or natural foam latex. Those are the three prosthetic materials. So I made a breast prosthetic out of each one of them. It also allowed me to employ various anatomical models, women who would be willing to allow themselves to be photographed with their breasts exposed, so that we could actually show how natural breast motion occurs and show that these costume technology materials could not replicate that natural motion, that natural fluidity. So a good part of uh, the grant covered that. It also allowed me to purchase a lot of 16-millimeter cameras and old 16-millimeter film to do a lot more comprehensive study about film technology. Uh, It also funded our 2012 trip to Bluff Creek so that we could actually do a survey of the site and document things about the site to um, allow a much better analysis of the film. Uh, So all of those things were involved in the grant. Have you ever tried to go to Bluff Creek and recreate the film, like make an absolute perfect carbon copy of it? you can't now. You can't now because the area that was completely open and clear that Patty walked through and that Roger filmed, that area is now completely overgrown with new growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely. So if you stand close to where Roger stood, you can't actually stand on the exact spot because a flood washed away some of the bank 
So if you try to stand where Roger was, you're seven feet in the air, uh, 15 feet from the cliff. So you can't actually stand on Roger's spot. But if you stood 15 feet in front at the edge of the cliff and looked in the direction that he's looking, you can't see anything except the new growth, unfortunately. Gotcha. gotcha. So well, it's been a long time. Of, yeah. Yeah, 50 years. So the prospect, unfortunately, of recreating it on site isn't uh, ever going to happen. Uh, what I would love to do more than anything would be to recreate the site, actually rebuilt the site as it was in 67 as a set, and then do a recreation filming there. That's always been one of my dreams. Do you, do you feel confident, Bill, that somebody, including yourself, could build a costume that good with all the muscles and tendons and... Not if you're restricted to 60, 1967 technology. No, I'm talking about today. Today. Oh, today? Today. You still can't solve the problem of the head shape. Oh. Uh, I would imagine that's why. Uh, yeah, yeah, the stretch fur is wonderful. The yeah. fluidity of uh, some of your uh, um, uh, resins that are skin flex resins that they use now that BJB Enterprises makes. Uh, you could do the motion of the breast. The s- stretched fabrics could do the stretching of the skin right. Uh, all of that could be done, and it would be very, very impressive. Definitely could be done. But you still can't get the right shape of the face. Yeah, but then you also have the problem of the compliant gait. The right, knee- I was going to bring that up. I'm glad you did, Doug. Yeah, and the knees that go in and out, the hip rotation. The, you know, the muscles so- rippling. Well, the muscles have got big enough, yeah, to pull it off, Joel. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of issues. Yeah. I always wonder what? if I could if I could give somebody sixty million dollars, which I can't. <laughs> but if I could, could they do a film that people go, "Oh my God, that looks real," or? Oh my God! That looks like a guy in a costume with practical effects, not CGI. Actual no, practical no, just effects. No effects, just the costume. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you could wanna... get it today. You could get it good enough to fool a lot of people. Yeah. Um, no, but I'm talking about a side by side. Side by side. Side by side with Patty, an yes. exact replica. Yep. No. Ain't gonna happen. No, no, I wouldn't think so. I always no. tell people, well, the Patterson creature looks like a guy in a suit until you see a guy in a suit. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you know, you're right on that. Yeah. You, you really are, because now I'm watching it more and more as we're talking. I keep looping it around to watch the video. Yeah, just, and, you know. And just, there's just no way. You have too many moving components. You got the muscles ripper, rippling. You have the breasts jiggling. To use yeah. a technical term, yeah, I don't, have, well, even, tendons are what really the skin, even the way the skin is shifting, yeah, on the hip and the leg when she's looking back, uh, because there are certain patterns in the um, the skin that allow you kind of they're kind of like markers, and you can watch the way that they shift, and the way that they shift. Uh, it's just practically nothing that would do that, which isn't natural organic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Well, you would know. I mean, it's just, it's just, an, it's just amazing piece of footage. I guess the next question I kind of have in the back of my head watching this was, was there a chance that there was more than one Bigfoot? Because I, I would have chased after this thing. I, I would, I would yeah. have thrown caution to the wind, and I would have, I, I would have chased that. But what stopped them from truly pursuing it through the woods? Uh, that I can't actually answer for you. I know he ran out of film, so he stopped mm-hmm. filming. Um, and they talked about how they tracked him or her into the woods, and they thought that she sat for a while up in the uh, ridge looking down at him, but uh, once. She, he stopped filming and she was finally going into the woods and they kind of lost sight of her. Um, I don't know why they didn't continue to pursue her. Maybe they were worried about documenting the trackway that was there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And loading more film in the camera and such. 
Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I think they were kind of taking stock of the situation. That would be my best guess. Well, I would imagine they're a little uh, they're a little shocked when they captured. Oh, Pat. more than a little. Yeah. <laughs> more than a little, yeah. I seem to remember Bob telling me that there was kind of an issue with the horses and the terrain, where Bob felt maybe he was good enough to handle the terrain, but maybe he felt Roger was not skilled enough as a well, Ro- horseback Roger's horse and the pack horse had run away. They had to go get them. Ooh. Yeah, Bob was still on his horse. Roger was on foot. And Roger's horse and the little white pack horse had run away. Oh, I had never heard that. Yeah, they had to go back and get the horses. Yeah, have you yeah. Heard that, Joel? I've never heard that. I, I have never heard that. That's the first time I heard that the horses actually left the scene. Oh, I never and, knew that. And I, yeah, guess, I don't know how far away it went, but yeah, they went away. Yeah, being a they hunter, because I, 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 I'm up. also... I'm also outdoorsman. The first thing, also, the second thing that come to my mind is how many are out in the woods right now watching us. As in, if we take any kind of threatening action, are we leaving these woods? Mm-hmm. One, you know, one, them, thing, be, uh, yeah. one thing about the Patterson footage, Joel, is that not only do you have the film, but it left footprints. Yes, yes, it did. It left all sorts of physical evidence. Probably. I mean, it, times I have. have you ever studied footprints, Bill? Uh, yeah, actually, I did on another grant that I got. I actually reconstructed the four and a half footprints that we have on film in three dimension, full scale. And oddly mm. enough, you know, most people they look at the film and they can see the grounds kind of funny. But they don't realize how irregular the ground is. It's only when you actually see it in three dimension that you appreciate how real these footprints are because the first one is very fuzzy, like it's totally smudged. Second one is clear. Third one is a little clearer. Another one's a little fuzzy and such. But when you see the irregularity in the terrain, then it suddenly becomes clear why each footprint is formed the way that it is and lends mm-hmm. even more authenticity to the trackway in a way that most people haven't studied because most people just look at the pictures. You have to yeah. see it in physical three dimension to actually appreciate some of the more subtle reasons why this is an authentic trackway. It's not somebody just you know, digging the st- into the ground to make fake footprints. So not only whether they have had to pull off the suit, which you claim is impossible, right. they would have had to figure out a way to make a trackway at the exact yeah. same time. Yeah, and if they were using a stamp, you know, just a shaped foot and you pound it into the ground, stamp each footprint in, uh, mm-hmm. then in the trackway footage, the first print would be as sharp as the second and third, and it's not. Mm-hmm. They would be so carbon copies of each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's definitely not stamped in place. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at the footprints, do you see the weight distribution, like the the different parts of the creatures? The you know, because the gait. I want kind of want to get to the way it walks. Is that evident in that footprint? And then a lot of people have asked me throughout the years. When it's walking, it doesn't seem to be stumbling at all through the terrain that was there. Now, was the yeah, terrain, the terrain real rough? Too. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned that very earlier. Regular. Um, as far as the weight of... shift, that would be something that Jeff Meldrum would know far better than I. Uh, mm-hmm. But the terrain itself was very irregular, and yet he was walking through it as smooth as can be. Yeah. Yeah, and how many human actors wearing? I know we keep harping on the the costume thing I, I just can't get off that for a minute but how many human actors would be able to walk on that terrain being half blind really essentially because the costume was a full costume would right. be able to walk that and not once stumble and keep going the way that patty did i don't know any well another another, do, another problem is that those footprints were 14 and a half inches long okay even a person with like a size 12 foot, their, foot's, their shoe's probably only about 12 inches long, something about that approximately. 
Um, if you extend the toes on a costume foot, even a few inches, and a person is walking without deliberately lifting each foot up to clear the ground. So you're walking on what I like to call autopilot. That's your your automatic Mm -hmm. reflex walking. When you do that, you barely lift the foot enough to maybe clear about a half an inch above the ground. But because you're not bumping into anything, you've learned yeah. over the years how high you have to lift your foot just to clear ground to make that next step. But if you add a couple of more inches to that foot, it screws up your autopilot, and you're almost guaranteed you're going to trip over it unless you're consciously taking every step where you say, okay, raise the foot more, step it down, raise the other foot more, step it down. If you're not consciously trying to override your automatic walking pace, extend the foot out, you'll trip over the fake feet. It's like a person yeah, walking it's essentially, and Yeah, I was going to say, it's got to be like walking on skis then at that point, trying to, yeah. you know, because you're not used yeah. to that length. And, and you can't do that natural. automatically because your autopilot isn't calibrated for a foot of that length. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. And Bill, you're the one as far as I know, that has pretty much solved the problem on the height. Am I correct? Um, actually, no. <laughs> the height is still, still a good. little bit That's... ambiguous. Uh... I thought I'd solved it years ago and then found a mistake in my data, went back to the beginning and went over it all. But even nowadays, with all the data that we have, there's still an error in there somewhere uh, that is interfering with getting a final definitive calculation of the height. So it's, it's a problem we're still working on, but we've got to go through all of this data and find out where is the error. Because if you process a certain amount of data one way, it'll give you one measurement. If you process it another way, you'll get another measurement. And obviously, it can't be both. One has to be right. One has to be wrong. So we have to find out where that error is. And it's a little maddening because it's a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of data to wade through, um, and a fair amount of expense to go through all of this. But we are still working on the issue of trying to, once and for all, absolutely and definitively lock in her height and say, yes, she is X this many feet, this many inches tall. Is the, we will get there. Is, but is the error caused by the fact is the error caused by the fact we don't know the lens type? No. Well, that's part of it is solving the lens to a conclusive degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have two options, a twenty five millimeter synectar and a twenty millimeter Kodak and Stigmat. Those are the two possible lenses it could be. What's the minimum and what's the minimum height, Bill, and the maximum that you believe Patty to be? Um, well, unfortunately, the minimum puts her at four foot ten. Ah. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the more normal calculation puts her in at six three six four. So we're 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 struggling between these two. Now it would it would seem like you could just go ahead and say, oh come on, it's got to be the six foot three can't be the four foot ten but in terms of a rigid rigorous proof based entirely on data we can't quite get there because of this one error somewhere in the data so we have to find it well i kind of doubt it was the four foot because <laughs> i remember bob saying to me personally he said when he saw it it reminded him reminded him of a quarter horse it was yeah. that Well, you, I know, it's, it's, it, kind of, it's kind of maddening. We wish that we could resolve that one thing. Um, well, we will get it one day. Well, you know, it's too bad the Bluff Creek, you know, obviously nature takes over everything in the forest. But if we still had that perfect scene and watching her walk through, it'd make a whole lot easier figuring out the height because there were things in the foreground. Would, yes. Yeah, it would definitely it, would. It, 
Is it true, and I've just heard this, and I've never confirmed it, but that branches do not grow higher. They'll stay the same for 20 years, 30 years. Uh, I'm not an expert on trees and plants, but I believe you are correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've never confirmed they, that. But they, you will get thick, they will get thicker, they may get longer, but they will not go higher. Yeah. It's not yeah. like the trunk is pushing out of the ground. You know what? You're right. I, I, I only know this anecdotally. I had hung um, a bird feeder out probably a decade ago for my mother. And I showed up and, hey, look at that bird feeder. It's an exact length spot that I put it. It did not grow in that 10 years to become longer. But it did become yeah. thicker, but it did not get longer. It was that same spot that I put it. Right. Hmm. So... Just from my own experience, it did not grow anywhere. And this is on a, you know, it was about a half, about a middle-aged tree. So there was still growing going on. It just did not, the length didn't seem to go yeah. at all any further out. So, Bill, you've come to a conclusion, obviously. And I'm really curious as to what is the percentage of your assurance, either it's real or not real and 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 what are the reasons okay my assurance is 100 percent no ifs ands or buts it is authentic well the film was not staged in any way it was a spontaneous unplanned encounter and what we see in the film is not a human in a costume it is something biologically real exactly as it appears and it is some unknown form of a hominid species that may be a human, may be an ape, but it is whatever it is, it is biologically real as it appears. So 100%, yes, that's the conclusion. Um, I want what? to give you a, like 1%, maybe not, it's 100. Mm -hmm. was, was there one thing that brings it to the 100, or was it a whole bunch of different data points? They got you to that uh, 100%. A lot of data points, the fact that every one of the data points is on the side of authentic, and none of the data points, none whatsoever, are on the side of fake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, no red flags, not one. Not a single one. Wow. That's why the skeptics, when they try to discredit the film, they can't discredit the film using the film. So they always run to all the cheap, crappy gossip about Roger Patterson's life, trying yeah. to say, yeah, Roger Patterson was not a good man. He was not an honest man. And if he wasn't an honest and trustworthy man, then the film can't be honest or trustworthy because a dishonest mm -hmm. guy can't, of course, make an honest film, which is bullshit, if I can say that. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, the skeptics, when they try to discredit the film, they can't use the film to discredit it because it is 100% supportive of authenticity. So they always end up running to this gossip about Roger Patterson's life and try to put together a ridiculously lame case using this garbage anecdotal evidence. That's the way all the skeptics try to attack the film, and they never succeed. And they never so they tried to, so when they fail on the facts they go to character assassination is what you're saying pretty much yes that's exactly it yes yeah I, and what does his personal life have to do with a bigfoot so i mean that's just cheap like you'd said that's just dirty pool yeah okay. well also when you simply look at the reality of evidence Empirical evidence is the best evidence. That is what everybody wants to use for science, for law, for any type of factual determination. You want to work with good empirical evidence. That's the film. You do not want to work with anecdotal evidence, which is crappy gossip to begin with. Imagine, mm -hmm. if you will, you had a crime scene, okay? Somebody got murdered, and the police are all there investigating. Imagine if the lead detective said, don't bring in the crime scene investigators, don't take any forensic evidence, just canvas the neighborhood and talk to the neighbors and see what they tell you, and we'll solve the crime. <laughs> you know, that's, the way, that's the way the skeptics treat the Patterson film. That would be a horrible way. Power. 
they try to deny the good empirical evidence, the real evidence, and they want to go talk to the neighbors. They want mm-hmm. gossip. Yeah. Aren't you the second film forensic specialist, Bill, that's concluded this? Um, who's the first? Jeff Glickman. <laughs> oh, um, well, Jeff, his expertise is actually different. Um, he's an image analyst. So he analyzes photographic imagery. And that's basically all he does. Um, if you want to authenticate the Patterson film or truly analyze it and understand it, you can't just be an image analyst. You also have to be an actual filmmaker because a lot of the proof lies in understanding the process of shooting a film. And you have to know special makeup effects technology, and Glickman didn't know anything about that, uh, so that you can analyze the subject figure in the film. Mm-hmm. Well, so what what did Jeff bring to the table? Expertise, but that alone was not sufficient. Well, what what did he bring to the table, Bill? Um, I've read his report, and I'll be honest with you, he didn't really bring that much. Uh, not to be mm-hmm. critical or dismissive of him, uh, he's done a lot of other forensic work that apparently is very very respectable. And I did go to his house once with Chris Murphy, and he took us into the basement where he keeps what he calls the beast. It's his computer, and it's, I mean, it literally fills an entire room, and that room is chilled down to like 45 degrees because he's got so many computer processors, CPU units, going when he fires the thing up that he has to chill the room so that the thing doesn't overheat and shut down. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's a supercomputer. It's not a computer like an average person has, like a workstation. It is a small supercomputer that he has. And I'm sure that what he's done in a lot of his image analysis work um, is probably very, very impressive. But that particular skill in itself wasn't actually the main skill needed to solve the riddle of the Patterson film. So in that Mm -hmm. sense, he did what he could, but he didn't have background in the other areas to actually put Mm -hmm. the analysis over the top. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense. Uh, And uh, (laughs) I just keep on thinking of war games of the Whopper computer when you mention cooling the room. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, But no, uh, no, it's a good analogy. When you're looking at this, and I'm, again, I cannot stop watching this film. It's like it's got a whole new life for me now. And I keep looking for something, anything here that mm-hmm. would uh, that would sway me. And I, I can't find anything that would speak to a hoax. Not, not one thing. Now, as I'm looking at this film and I see this creature walking by, one thing I did notice that is so strange is the creature seemed to make eye contact with those two men. And I just oh, yeah. Googled it while you're talking. Animals, like animals other than humans and chimpanzees and stuff, they don't generally make direct eye contact as long as this creature did. There was a thought process in that creature's head that was oh, much yeah. higher than any other animals, and that just struck me like a lightning bolt. So that yep. speaks to a high intelligence, Bill. Yeah. Well, there's another thing. Very, very few people ever think about this or consider it. Um, They usually look at the famous look-back photo, which is the most famous image. Um, And she is taking a very aggressive stride, you know, the Mm -hmm. length from one one footstep to another, and the way her arms, one is stretched forward, one is stretched back. Because when you're walking aggressively, you're not just walking with your legs, but you're actually pumping the arms you know, the opposite of the leg. So your forward leg has a rearward arm, your rearward leg has a forward arm. Uh, This pumping motion speeds you up. I think it's sometimes described as a pendulum effect. Okay, most people are familiar with that, and they think all the time that she was walking away, 
she's in this power walk. But when you look at the beginning of the film, she isn't doing that at all. Her arms are hanging down at her side, and she's taking small, slow steps. Mm -hmm. And she's walking Mm -hmm. away as casually and relaxed as can possibly be. Mm -hmm. When she's looking back at the camera, she is walking in a very aggressive, concerned, uh, sort of uh, adrenaline-rushed determination to get out of there fast because they're threatening her. So you have to look at the environment. When Roger turned on his camera, he was a long ways away, and there was a creek between him and Patty. And she felt safe, like the creek was like a barrier protecting her. And maybe these strange creatures that are making noise over there, maybe they don't know how to cross the creek. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she started walking away as casual and relaxed as can be, apparently confident she could just walk away and disappear. It wasn't until Roger crossed the creek, came up the bank on the other side, saw her still in the open, and he charged forward, running at her as fast as he could. Bob was probably right beside him on horseback. That she looked back and she saw now there's no barrier between them. There's no creek protecting her. These people, these things, are charging forward like they're threatening me. And so I'd better speed up now and get the hell out of Dodge, you know, as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. Most people don't realize the behavioral interaction between what was going on, what Roger was doing, what she was doing, what the landscape involved, and her behavior when she was walking relaxed because she felt safe, when she was concerned because she felt threatened and she sped up her walk and was walking much more powerfully, and then when she slowed down again to a perfectly relaxed walk, when she was getting far enough ahead of them and she didn't see them pursuing her anymore. Roger was just standing there filming. So this behavioral thing that you see makes perfect sense with a real creature encountering some other strange mm-hmm. creatures in the woods. It makes There's a body language. No sense. If it was yeah. an actor in a costume, it makes no sense. If it was an actor in a costume, as soon as you turn on the camera and you yell action... The actor in the costume would think, okay, I have to do some big, wild, scary, threatening action. But Patty didn't do that. Yeah, I'm here to be a Bigfoot, so I'm going to be a Bigfoot. Yeah. Is is what the actor's mindset would be. Now, her body yeah. language mm-hmm. speaks volumes. Watch exactly, She actually does. has a look of fear in her yeah. eyes. Yeah, when in the look back, yeah, because he's so close. Yep. He is just charged right at her, running at her furiously. She didn't know if he's going to stop or going to run right up to her face. So, yeah, she's scared, and she wants to get out of there fast. But in the beginning, she wasn't scared at all. And that's the last thing in the world an actor would do if you roll the camera and yell action is just to ever so casually walk out of there like he was just walking to the corner to get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. A ton of people have mentioned to me, isn't it possible there were there was a juvenile behind that, you know, the root ball or up in the woods, and she was leading them away, you know, by walking fairly calm instead of running? Oh, yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the film will never tell us one way no. or another, but yes, um, the behavior is absolutely possible. Um, this idea of a decoy drawing... Uh, potential threats away from a juvenile or a nest or an infant or something is a well-established biological behavior. So certainly it's plausible to consider. It's very interesting. I mean, that seems to be a big objection to, you know, a lot of primatologists have looked at it. Well, she's too calm. She's not scared. She's just walking. And um, although she's walking in a very weird way, your expertise does or doesn't allow you to study her gait, Bill? Um, I haven't worked on it as a specific line of research. Um, I suspect that more can be done with the film along those lines, yes. But I haven't. There's basically (laughs) so many things that I've been going at, a lot of things that um, 
are specifically related to the question of whether or not it's a costume um, mm-hmm. that I had to kind of get my attention to first because I had the expertise in those areas. Mm-hmm. But there's still a lot that needs to be done, and that would definitely be one of the areas that still could be explored in greater detail, yeah. I, I would really think you would be amazing. I would imagine you're not a trained um, locomotion expert, but I just, Bill, every time I talk to you, you always amaze me. You know, you're one of the smartest people on the planet. Well, I thank you for that compliment. Yeah. Well, one thing Did, very cool, though, is and I just want to interject this really quickly, talking to you while watching the film. Now, I would love everyone to watch the film while you listen to the show again. Watch that film while he's talking. It will shed a lot of light to you, if you even if you've seen it a million times. When he's telling you about the film, it did for me. It fills in a lot of blanks, and you notice a lot of nuances you did not notice before. And it, it really it, it sheds that whole, it gives it new life. It really does. And you have someone as skilled as Bill talking to us about it. About the you know the way she was looking, uh, about the the walk, things such as that. I really want to thank you for coming on the show yeah. and, and sharing that. You're with welcome. Us. If I can Bill. comment on that, there is so much in the film that it's actually very difficult to look at it and think you've seen everything. Your attention actually does go to certain elements within the film, and that's all you actually see. Mm-hmm. So you actually have to look at it again and again and again each time with a different focus of your attention to really take in all of what the film entails. That's why it's such an extraordinary treasure, treasure trove of data. Mm-hmm. I would agree. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Yeah, I remember spending, gosh, day after day, um, putting it on a digital edit system where you could you could make the film go forward and then backwards and forwards and backwards and that's when you start seeing that muscle you know that tendon flex and expand and contract and that's when you go oh my goodness <laughs> yeah what you have to do is you have to take a certain set of images and then you have to anchor them somehow so mm-hmm. that what you're studying moving is moving in a certain way, but it's anchored to something so that that particular movement is clearer. When you just look at the film, because of the camera shake now and then and the panning of the film and such, it's a little harder to focus on a particular anatomical element. But when you take a, a segment of stills and you anchor them somehow, then you can study a certain type of movement or emotion or an action, and it becomes infinitely clearer to you. Yes. Yeah, well, we'd be remiss if we did not mention that you wrote a really cool book that's out there, When Roger Met Patty. So if you want to dive deeper into all this, Bill has written quite the book that you can buy. And and on Amazon right now, paperback, 1995, you can get this book for when Roger met Patty, one minute of film, 47 years of controversy. Check that book out. I highly suggest you guys buy it and, and read it. I, I know I will be doing the same right after the show. I cannot wait to uh, read your book, Bill, and really dive into this with you. Yep. Yeah, the book really covers all of my research over many years, and it goes into it in an incredible amount of detail. If you read the book, you will literally come out of it knowing how to build an ape suit. It's that comprehensive. And then you'll understand all the more why what we see in the film is not a costume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, exactly, take us to the nuts and bolts of your what you've uncovered with the Patty film and, and with your skilled eye with all these years in Hollywood and being the special effects master that you are. And, and who better to give this film a look than you? I mean, mm-hmm. you have the ins and the outs of Hollywood, how things work. Most of us don't. And so we're lucky you're sharing right. that with us. Is there anything that you would maybe want to share with the audience that's listening that, that may, maybe, you know, you just kind of a point that you want to get across more than anything else about the film? Um, 
about the only thing I can say is if there was one lady in all of the world that I wished I could meet, it would be Patty. <laughs> I would definitely take her on a date and everything. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> one girl I really would love to meet. I'd even pay. Oh, come on. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so what's next for you, Bill? I mean, what, what, uh, are you still working on this? This is still your labor right here. Uh, what would you like to have done next to the film? Are you looking to expand on like, uh, with Dr. Jeff Meldrum on the footprints or the gate? I mean, what, what would, if the sky was the limit, what would you love to have analyzed next? Cause it's just so many moving parts of this film. Yeah. Well, one of them is I definitely like to finish solving that height question that Doug brought up earlier. Because that's mm-hmm. driving me nuts, that, that it's so difficult to solve. <laughs> and I do want to get to it uh, one day or another. Um, there's another thing that I've, I've wanted to do for a long time. It's a, a way of actually enhancing the quality of the film by using multiple copies and blending them together to eliminate the film grain and increase the prospect of using some of the new image sharpening technologies to bring the detail of the film out even more. Um, Mm -hmm. That's definitely one of my ambitions, and I've talked with Doug a lot about it. It's a process called grain nullification. Unfortunately, some of these things cost money, and I don't have it myself to put into it. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, Um, yeah, a grant. And it's just sitting there waiting to be done, but they will take some money put into them in order to accomplish it. Well, if anyone's listening that's got a couple million bucks burning a hole in your pocket, <laughs> there's a lot less, a lot worse things you could spend your I'll money on. It. So if you want to yeah. help expand the research into this film, absolutely. Bill, Bill is looking for investors or would welcome investors, let's just put it that way, to to expand yeah. this well, build, not build. In film. Yeah, it's not just research in the film. It has the potential of being an astonishingly powerful revelation to the whole yeah it really is a would be a revolution in the physical anthropology field Mm -hmm. and what it can do to change and expand our knowledge of this whole scientific field Mm -hmm. would more than justify any investment into it Mm -hmm. well unfortunately we're out of time chasing a cryptid it's yeah. really actually revolutionizing physical anthropology. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it would push a lot of things forward. I really do. I'm right there with you. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Great Bill Munns, everybody. I mean, just, it's been a real, you, Bill. real pleasure, Bill. Really, Thanks, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And while you're yeah. at it, I want you guys to visit untoldradio.com because I will have this show posted up in minutes. So if you're listening live and you want to hear this thing again, it will be posted up tonight to untoldradioam.com. So you can listen again and weigh in with your thoughts. Until next time, guys, take care of each other, love each other. This is myself, and I got uh, Doug. Man, thank you so much for being the co-host again. I mean, thank you, fine. Joe. You rock, man. You really do. But again, take care of each other, love each other, and After watch some Patty. AM as a production of Midwest Radio Productions. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And please visit www.americas most hauntedcom Introducing Peacock, the new free streaming service from NBC Universal. It's hit movies, current shows, live sports, trending bits, and timeless hits. And that's why you can't not watch. Peacock, watch for free, upgrade for more. Stream now at PeacockTV.com. Law and Order SVU streaming now.